Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, another major event that occurred last week was the arrival of the team from the IMF to assess whether Sri Lanka was on the right path. They're currently in the country and meeting various government and private uh, entities to see whether their commands are being carried out. This team of 10 from the IMF is here as part of their regular consultation with uh, Sri Lanka to see whether we are carrying out all their recommendations to the letter. If you don't, then no second tranche. This team is expected to be on the island till this Tuesday. The message is very simple. Do as we say, this is the way. And keep in mind that uh, these policies they are pushing for helps uh, the creditors, other member nations and more so the United States. This time their requirement is straightforward. Implement five key points. If you do this as per their recommendations to the letter, then an economic renaissance for Sri Lanka. But if uh, things go sour, don't worry. Those liberal think tanks will spring into action to clean up the mess. If only we had some previous experiences with the IMF to determine how their policies really work for a developing nation like ours. Hmm. So those five key points they want to implement is very simple. They are revenue-based fiscal consolidation, restoration of public debt sustainability, aka restructuring local debt, measures to restore price stability in key commodities, policies to ensure the safety of the financial sector, and then of course, the buzzword, get rid of corruption. Let's get Danidu Tanwazamin, who's at the data board, uh, to break this down further. Danidu, explain this to uh, me. Uh, the IMF's five key points for Sri Lanka's revival, has it been done before? Now, very interestingly, Mahesh, uh, my job today becomes very easy because of how you framed it. The five points haven't been phrased as five points when we look at the previous years. Now I'm going to look at five years in particular, so the five times in particular where we uh, went, went towards the IMF just before this specific session from 2001 towards 2016 and we spoke about that session uh, uh, quite a while. The things that we do notice, Mahesh, however, are this, the separation or the changes in the words that have been used. In 2001 and the 2003 program, you will notice that 2003 we had gone for two specific programs, which was one the extended fund facility and one the extended credit facility. In both of those things, what they mention is privatization led growth should be what's present in a country. They are very critical of state-centered growth or state-centered control of certain enterprises. We see that happening today and in a platter we are giving it. So we have seen this across these many uh, tranches that we have gotten as a sort of like a cut-paste policy that have been implemented. From 2009 to 2016, another interesting thing happens. The word privatization led uh, growth changes into state enterprise reform. That is the, that is, uh, it's almost the same content, but rather a different sort of approach. And one thing that is a cross-cutting theme, Mahesh, as you mentioned within your first point, is called fiscal revisions. Now, everywhere what they mention is that Sri Lanka has a chronic budget deficit issue that they have to address all throughout these five tranches. And that is particularly what they're trying to address even in this case, and what they're trying to discuss even right now. So it's fair to say it's a copy-paste scenario even right now. Um, the IMF apparently, uh even though we keep saying in this program and in various other programs is the fact that they're not interested in developing Sri Lanka per se, they're more interested in making sure that the creditors get back whatever they loan to us uh, and that is something that we all need to keep in mind as we move on. As always, Danidu Tanavasam and the Data Board, thank you. Well, let's get more perspective on this and as to whether this policy requirement by the IMF will really enhance Sri Lanka's economic potential and take it to the next level. Joining me now all the way from Sacramento, California, via Zoom is political economist Dr. Devaka Gunawardhana. Doctor, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. The IMF uh, team is in Sri Lanka and they insist on local debt restructuring. They say that's the way for us to proceed. But many local economists here, doctor, don't see it that way. What they see is a possible banking crisis that would leave the people of this country in a serious conundrum. So how do you analyze this? Are those local economies wrong and the IMF is correct or what is the case here? So Mahesh, um, one of the issues is that the IMF has already imposed very stringent targets on Sri Lanka. Uh, for example, they have said that Sri Lanka needs to meet a primary surplus, which means balancing government revenue with expenditure by next year. 
and to even get so much as a two and a half percent surplus by 2025. And that has to do, obviously, with the government's budget. But in addition, they are also now promoting um, this idea of domestic debt restructuring. And what this is, is conflating uh, these two different issues, uh, which are the external debt and the domestic debt. And so for the external debt, you know, about 50 percent of Sri Lanka's external debt is commercial borrowing. And of that, over a third are these international sovereign bonds. And so these external bondholders, you know, these big hedge funds, for example, uh, based abroad, mostly in the West, but also in other countries, they have um, essentially recouped much of their uh, much of their investment. And so they are trying to now get even more from the country by forcing these austerity targets. So that's the external debt. But then when we talk about the domestic debt, we have to look at um, who's involved, what are the actors involved? And of course, there are the domestic banks, but there are also the retirement funds. And so when we're talking about whose debt this is, we have to be very clear that any debt restructuring that affects ordinary people, depositors, people who have put their money into banks, into pensions, into savings funds, they're not the ones who are responsible for this crisis. Indeed, uh, that's the thing, Dr. Uh, most of us, the innocent, pay for this, but not the top 1%. So, Doctor, uh, we have been saying, and lots of economists on this show have been saying, that the IMF program is not on par to get this country back on track. It is more or less a patchwork done to benefit the top 1% rather than the middle income class and the low income category. But when we look at events that's occurring in this country right now, we see that the rupee is strengthening and things are normalizing. Was the previous analysis wrong? Well, Mahesh, I think this, again, is part of the confusion when we talk about the economy is that we have to distinguish the real economy, what's happening to ordinary people and these other indicators. You know, so, for example, you know, what the IMF and establishment economists call price stability. OK, inflation might be you know, moderating, supposedly, but that does not reduce the permanent one-time hike in the cost of living that occurred last year with the rupee devaluation, with the interest rate hikes, so that people's incomes are essentially worth half of what they were before the crisis. So you see that, right, in the social indicators like the fact that, you know, nearly over a third of Sri Lankan households are facing food insecurity. Urban poverty has tripled. And, you know, this actually goes back to an issue that we confronted even under the Rajapaksas, where they talked about economic growth. They talked about 8% economic growth after the war. And what we're realizing now is that this, a lot of this was fictitious growth. It was investment in real estate, it was investment in infrastructure without returns. And this did not actually improve ordinary people's lives. And now we're seeing the ramifications through this whole process of austerity and debt restructuring. So again, these governments, including the current one, have a very skewed understanding of what the economy actually is. If they only believe that, you know, inflation, quote unquote, coming down is the real measure when it's actually things like the cost of living. Indeed, Doctor, both sides are playing the public of Sri Lanka and not telling them the accurate picture. It is now very evident. Now, um, when the previous administration was in power, one of the biggest accusations by the short-sighted liberals was that printing money by the Rajapaksa administration was why inflation was at an all-time high. Now, under this administration, Doctor, this governor, the current one, uh, has printed more than one trillion rupees. 
How do you see this? It doesn't look like the current lot is coming up with any new ideas. So, Mahesh, the reality is that every government prints money. That's essentially how, you know, these operations are run. And in this case, this accusation about money printing really came from a set of well-funded neoliberal uh, think tanks. And they basically decoupled monetary policy, which is, you know, for example, the interest rate from fiscal policy. So even during the, the crisis, you know, over the past couple of years, even under the previous administration, there was hardly any actual spending in terms of relief. Sri Lanka spent less than 1% of GDP in 2020 for COVID-related, pandemic-related relief. So there has not been relief for the people. And so if we talk about money printing, we have to be very careful that these arguments are not, again, used to impose another form of austerity. Again, in 2021, the stock market almost doubled. But we saw the crisis affecting people's lives. And so I think we have to, again, think more in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of spending measures, which both this government and the previous Rajapaksa government neglected. Indeed, Dr. I agree. Neoliberalism is the biggest curse we have right now to deal with. It was a manage uh, to fool everyone. Right now, we have to actually rethink as to what's going on. We have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. And that was the political economist, Dr. Devakar Kudamarudana. A short break. Back in a moment.